everybody, my name is Pedro Volpiani, I'm a mechanical engineer and I did my PhD and my postdoc in compressible and reactive flows. Today we're gonna talk about Mach number and speed of sound. Don't forget to follow the channel if you like the video. The Mach number is a dimensionless quantity given by the ratio of the flow velocity and the local speed of sound. It is one of the key quantities in fluid mechanics since it characterizes different flow regimes. As a rule guide, compressible effects can be ignored at Mach numbers below approximately 0.3. In this situation, the flow can be modeled as an incompressible flow and the changes in pressure, temperature and density are negligible. In this case, to solve the flow field, only the conservation equations of mass and momentum are needed, provided the corresponding boundary and initial conditions are given. The compressible regime can be divided in four branches. We refer to the subsonic regime when the fluid velocity around the body remains everywhere inferior than the local speed of sound. In other words, the Mach number is less than 1 everywhere. When there are zones in the flow where the local Mach number exceeds unity, while the generating flow, the upstream condition, remains subsonic, we are in the transonic regime. When the incoming flow has a Mach number greater than 1, the flow is supersonic. Finally, if the Mach number typically exceeds 5, we enter the hypersonic regime. Note that this threshold is questionable. Let's recall that acoustic problems always require allowing compressibility, since sound waves are compression waves involving changes in pressure and density of the medium through which they propagate. Let's now talk about sonic boom. When an aircraft travels through air, it creates a series of pressure waves in front of the aircraft and behind it, similar to the bow and stern waves created by a boat. These waves travel the speed of sound, and as the speed of the object increases, the waves are forced together or compressed, because they cannot get out of each other's way quickly enough. Eventually, they merge into a single shock wave, which travels at the speed of sound, a critical speed known as Mach 1. As long as the source moves at a speed higher than the speed of sound, the sound vibrations form a cone that moves with the source. For an observer at rest, initially situated outside this cone, everything happens as if the source did not exist. Now imagine that the wavefront that separates the disturbed and undisturbed regions reaches the observer. At that moment, the observer notices the pressure waves emitted by the source. The difference in sound level between the two situations makes him say that he heard a boom. Thus, the sonic boom is the sound associated with the shock waves created whenever an object traveling through the air travels faster than the speed of sound. Sonic booms, due to large supersonic aircraft, can be particularly loud and startling, tend to awaken people and may cause minor damages to some structures. The half angle between the direction of light and the shock wave alpha is given by the inverse of the Mach number. Now let's see how we compute the speed of sound. Sound or acoustic waves are longitudinal waves. That means that they have the same direction of vibration as the direction of propagation, and they result from an oscillation of pressure. Let's consider a sound wave moving into a stagnant gas. To do so, consider a long constant air tube filled with a fluid and having a piston at one end. The fluid is initially at rest and has density rho, pressure p and temperature t. At a certain instant, the piston is given an incremental velocity du to the left. The fluid particles immediately next to the piston are compressed a very small amount as they acquire the velocity of the disturbance. As the piston and these compressed particles continue to move, the next group of fluid particles is compressed, and the wave front is observed to propagate through the fluid at the characteristic sonic speed of magnitude A. The sound wave itself is a thin region of disturbance in the air across which the pressure, temperature and density change slightly. Imagine now that we hop on the sound wave and move with it. This procedure changes the frame of reference to the wave front. 
we went from an unsteady problem to a stationary flow which is easier to analyze. Note that this is equivalent to superimpose on the entire flow field a constant velocity to the right of magnitude a. Thus, if we look to the left, we are going to have a flow with properties rho, p, t and a. And if we look to the right, we are going to have a perturbed state with properties rho plus the rho, p plus the p, t plus the t and a plus the a. Since the wave front is extremely thin, we can use a control volume of infinitesimal thickness and apply the fundamental equations discussed in lecture 2 to derive an expression for the sound speed. Let points 1 and 2 be ahead of and behind the wave respectively. In the case of a stationary ideal flow, the Euler equations are written as follows, where n denotes the unit normal pointing outward the control surface S. Applying these equations to the control volume shown in the figure, the equations governing the flow of an ideal fluid are immediately obtained. But we know that rho 1 equals rho, rho 2 equals rho plus the rho, u1 equals a, u2 equals a plus the a, and so on. Then, we can write the continuity equation as follows. The product of two small quantities, the rho times the a, is very small in comparison to the other terms and can be ignored. By proceeding similarly, the conservation of momentum gives us the following expression. Replacing the last relation, rho dA by minus a d rho, we obtain immediately a square equals dP d rho. However, the derivative dP d rho is not unique, it depends entirely on the process. Thus, it should be written as a partial derivative with the appropriate subscript. Since we are analyzing an infinitesimal disturbance with no heat transfer and friction effects, the process is both reversible and adiabatic, which means that it is isentropic. Thus, the speed of sound is given by the square root of partial p, partial rho, at constant s. We saw in the first lecture that for an isentropic flow, p equals a constant times rho to the power of gamma. Then, partial p, partial rho at a constant s is equal to gamma p over rho. And finally, using the equation of state of a perfect gas, we obtain that the sound speed a equals the square root gamma rt. Thus, the speed of sound in a perfect gas depends only on the temperature of the gas. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to visit my website for more videos and exercises. See you in the next lecture.